The subject matter that I'll be talking about today is Bitcoin's volatility. Is it a friend or is it a foe? One aspect of volatility that one aspect of Bitcoin that does not encounter volatility is its programmatic supply schedule, which makes it very different from other money-like assets out there. I've been thinking a lot about time lately. Uh, as you know, Bitcoin's block time changes, and I've been spending a lot more time with the people I love most in the world. Uh, as a result, my kids know more about what I do than they used to. The other day, my son came to me and said, Dad, can I have a Bitcoin? I said, well, sheesh, you know, $8,525 is a lot of money. And then I thought about it for a minute, and I said, you know, I'm not sure what you'd do with $8,639 anyway. And then I said, you know, we just don't have $8,415 to throw out like that. Bitcoin's volatility is the stuff of legend. And it's dogged Bitcoin's narrative as peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash, which was its original stated purpose in the Bitcoin white paper. For traders and speculators who are just in it to make a return, uh, whether Bitcoin is viable as money doesn't matter very much. And Bitcoin's volatility can be a fatal attraction. Today, I'll be talking to two traders, veterans of some of the largest OTC desks in the business. Mike Morrow is the chief executive of Genesis Trading. And Yinfeng Xiao is a former trader at Circle Trading and now co-founder of Reciprocity Trading. Welcome, Mike and Yin. Thanks for having me. Mike, I want to put the first uh, question to you. Um, so I, I want to think ahead to the having since it's going to be happening possibly while we're talking here, mm -hmm. uh, OTC desks like yours, um, handle a lot of the volume for Bitcoin, uh, uh miners, right. Who have some of the largest, uh, needs mm -hmm. to sell, uh, and the largest lots to put into the market at the, uh, in a sort of a sudden period of time. What do you think? Uh, miners' reaction will be, uh, what are you expecting to see once the halving comes in and um, uh, and the supply of Bitcoin coming into miners' pockets is uh, is cut by half? Is that going to affect the way they behave? And by extension, is it going to affect the way the rest of us? Oh, goodness. Um, I think that, well, hopefully um, miners have planned for this event for a long, long time. And so that what happens over the next few blocks isn't really a uh, determining factor to how they think about anything, frankly. Um, and the miners that we've spoken to certainly have had this on their, um, their, their roadmap and their project planning for, for quite some time. Whether that means sort of um, the thoughts around how the price might behave, um, but, you know, frankly, I think a lot of it has, has to do with um, the, the difficulty level in a vacuum and say, OK, if difficulty remains the same and the price is this and then the production um, of, of, of the new, uh, newly minted coins is cut in half, how does that affect our ability to, to survive? Um, and so, you know, I don't think the, the having event itself um, should dictate any more behavior than, you know, so when they were planning for this stuff 6, 12, 24 months ago. Um, as an affected event. Um, but I do argue that uh, it probably drove their decisions around new CapEx. Um, what kind of new mining equipment should we be thinking about? How do we operate the most efficiently in that kind of environment? Taking into account the possibility um, that some of the miners drop out of the game if the Bitcoin price doesn't cooperate. What about the other side of the equation? The having certainly drives interest in Bitcoin. And as uh, my colleague Noel was talking about with um, Catherine Cawley from Binance earlier, it drives understanding of the way Bitcoin works. Do you think this event brings in new participants, new investors who are suddenly attracted or newly attracted to this kind of a programmatic supply schedule? Yin, I want to put that question to you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that, you know, as a whole, you know, crypto is still a very small part of like the overall financial ecosystem. Um, and so a lot of times we're just not in people's headspace. Um, and so this is just a way for us to get out there, kind of it draws eyeballs back in, right? It gets people thinking about it. And, you know, I have a lot of co former colleagues who are like, okay, well, I thought about buying this stuff two years ago, right? A year ago, six months ago. And now it's kind of the time to kind of revisit, is this worthwhile for me? Um, so anything that kind of drives that interest is is definitely, uh, you know, worthwhile. Yin, for those people, is volatility an attractive feature or is it uh, one of the detractors of Bitcoin? Uh, I would say it's much more of a, you know, detractor. Um, 
Huh. It, it really depends on who you are, right? But if, if your long term, if your goal for this is sort of viewing it as a long term investment, right? I mean, sort of like your uh, sort of like your example with, with your kid, right? Um, if you see a five percent drawdown the first day, you decide to finally pull the trigger and get in, right? Well, that's going to be you know that's going to be a pretty uh, tough hurdle to overcome later on in terms of just your overall sentiment towards the space. Yeah, I guess if I was paying my kids allowance in uh, Bitcoin, either uh, either one of us would get wrecked, right? That's pretty much exactly. the... <laughs> well, uh, M- Mike, what do you think? Is this, a, uh, I mean, just on the basic question, for a new investor to Bitcoin, feature or a bug volatility? I would agree with the end. I actually do think it's 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 more of a feature than a bug. Ultimately, I think it comes down to expected volatility. What did you expect coming into the asset class versus what did you actually get? Um, hopefully, um, with, with Bitcoin having been around for now for about 11 years, um, volatility is expected um, and that it really shouldn't catch people off guard. Um, and it's one thing, I think, if you expected you know, low level volatility and then you kind of got what Bitcoin gives you, you know, even, even on a day like today. But um, as long as sort of the volatility that's expected is somewhat in line with what you're getting, um, I do think that within a, a you know um, a, a properly allocated portfolio construction, in terms of the things that are volatile versus things that may not be, I do think that um, you know the volatility um, plays into why um, investors are certainly interested. You're talking about expectations, and I think it's an uh, interesting way to sort of jump into a macro context. Certainly, people's expectations about um, uh, U.S. stocks, for example, the S&P 500. Uh, were thrown for a loop uh, two months ago uh, on March 12. And since then, you've seen S&P volatility enter Bitcoin territory, as I would say, and then at times kind of touch Bitcoin's level of volatility along the way, if you look at 30-day volatility over that time. Does heightened volatility in stocks, assuming that continues, does that sort of affect people's perception of you know what it means to be really volatile? Does Bitcoin maybe benefit by comparison, in other words? Um, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one first. So certainly um, expected volatility in equities, um, fixed income, commodities um, were much, much lower than what we experienced, you know, call it two months ago. And I think that was part of the panic in the marketplace is that things that were happening um, should not be happening. We were seeing, you know, limit down days um, on, on consecutive days within within the week. And I think um, you know, you have that crazy environment. You had, you know, just a few weeks ago, oil futures trading below zero. These are not normal expected events within the marketplace. And so, which is why I think the, the traditional investors in those markets had a really difficult time trying to kind of understand why something like this is happening um, and try to balance that out against, well, this is what we thought and what we got was something entirely different. In rel- relatively speaking, um, you know, the, the expected and continued volatility in Bitcoin, um, it, it's kind of par for the course. Um, Bitcoin was doing what it was supposed to be doing in an expected volatility environment, where it was, I, I would argue that it was frankly the other asset classes that uh, behaved irrationally. Let's think about that for a second, though, because there's been a number of analyses that have pointed to um, uh, market structure as one of the reasons why Bitcoin fell as far as it did on March 12. Ian, what do you think, you know, specifically some of the derivatives markets that tend to kind of drive the price down with the uh, liquidation engines that they employ? Uh, did the markets perform as expected on March 12 or, or are there, is there sort of work to do on market structure? Um, I mean, there's always work to do on market structure. Um, I think... It, in comparison to previous events, this actually turned out pretty well, I would say. The first day that back in November of 2017, when we first cracked 10,000, when Bitcoin first cracked 10,000 and then dropped right back through 10,000, basically every exchange went down. Um, so compared to that, right, uh, March 12th was pretty tame um, in terms of sort of the all the platforms that offer uh, traders a large amount of leverage and then consequently liquidate their positions. Um, I mean, that's just the sort of structural volatility that we deal with that maybe other markets don't deal with as much. Certainly you have, you know, like retail FX platforms that allow for up to, you know, something like 500x leverage or something like that. Um, But those tend to be for uh, underlying assets that have, you know, a tenth of the volatility that Bitcoin and other crypto assets have. Um, so the combination of the extreme amount of leverage that we have in our system, as well as the volatility kind of uh, lends itself these, to these kinds of uh, 
extreme events. Um, and I think on top of that, for March 12th specifically, um, you had sort of DeFi adding into that, um, where you had a lot of ETH effectively being liquidated um, that, uh, you know, uh, was akin to more uh, more liquidations. Um, folks got, uh, you know, there was a lot of ETH that yeah. was sold. Can, can, you, can you just run that down? What happened there? Because I think it, maybe not everybody watching is familiar with, uh, with the zero ETH auction uh, that took place yeah. on March 12th. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a number of DeFi loans out there that were collateralized in ETH. And so as ETH kept on dropping, the value of this collateral kept on dropping. And at a certain point, the collateral wasn't enough to cover the size of the loan. And so then the, uh, so then you know these systems tend to, at that point, uh, try to sell out that ETH and try to recover as much of that loan as possible. And so in a system that was simply overwhelmed, right, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these ETH uh, auctions uh, landed pretty close to zero. And so now you have a bunch of folks who just paid close to nothing on a huge amount of ETH, right? They're going to turn around and sell it immediately. They're not going to hang on to that necessarily. Um, and so that just added to, you know, added to the pressure of that day. I, I think that's a, I mean, the whole events there, especially when it comes to DeFi, it raises some interesting questions for that use case, right? For crypto. And that doesn't, that's not limited to ETH. I think that that use case of DeFi should include Bitcoin if you think ahead to, you know, the long-term use of potentially digital gold or, or whatever it's going to be. So I, mean, I guess, Mike, going back to your point uh, earlier about like long-term investors, uh, and, and you know, we were talking about sort of whether they view volatility as a, you know, as a, as a positive or a negative. I would feel for a short-term investor, you would be looking for volatility, right? But for a long-term investor, that volatility counts against maybe your, um, your thinking, depending on your expectations, as you mentioned. What are the positive features that a, that a long-term investor can look to and think, I'm going to buy this and hold it for the long term? We saw Paul Tudor Jones uh, enter the market in that kind of a, 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 a wise earlier this week. Um, what should long-term investors be looking at as the metrics that indicate Bitcoin and other crypto assets reaching their maturity? For me, um, you know, I, I think we've we've touched on this earlier about the primary use case of Bitcoin still being speculation a bet that the price of Bitcoin is going to be much, much higher at some point in the future than it is today. Um, if your expected volatility was low, I don't know how long it's going to take to possibly reach those price targets that people are throwing out there for, the, for certain the possibilities of Bitcoin. I think when we think about volatility, we tend to kind of think about negative volatility. Um, volatility works both ways. Um, it goes we're up and down. And if Bitcoin is to reach um, the, the, you know, some of the larger price targets, six figures, seven figures per coin, you don't get there without the heightened volatility, um, which is why I do think that for longer term investors, it's just much, much easier to, time and hold, uh, to buy and hold. You can't time entries and exits. Um, you don't know when Bitcoin is going to have one of those really crazy outsized return days. Um, and so, you know, it really is a much better thing to just buy the Bitcoin you're, you're comfortable holding um, and then just effectively forget about it. No one can because the price of Bitcoin is too interesting to, to just kind of like leave on the sidelines for a few years. But um, ultimately, um, I would argue that um, for, for, for Bitcoin to work as a speculative asset, uh, the associated volatility has to be there. Yen, thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think it is a, you know, volatility is a feature, uh, a positive feature in the sense of, you know, if you don't have access to anything else that can get this sort of outsized return for you, right? Like Bitcoin or other crypto, like that might be your only chance to get a venture style payoff uh, on any sort of investment, right? Like we here in the US are obviously very spoiled in the sense of we have a lot, of, you know, we have every single payout profile known to man, right? We can, we can sort right. of access by uh, our financial markets, but if Bitcoin, if Bitcoin is sort of one of your only ways um, to, you know, to even have a chance of like doubling or tripling, you know, uh, whatever your investment is, right? Then you're going to take that chance because you have nothing else. Yeah. Um, one question I want to ask is related to the sort of digital gold use case. If inflation and central bank digital currencies put pressure on the dollar in terms of its geopolitical importance, do you think we could see an era of increased volatility in reserve currencies? Mike, what, what are your thoughts on that? Ultimately, I guess it's the question of um, are we really going to see inflation within the, for, the, for the U.S. dollar? Um, you know, uh, given the amount of, of, of money printing that we've seen in the last month or two, 
um, interestingly, against the offset of, of this Bitcoin happening, which is kind of going the other way, um, which is, I think, is part of the reason why uh, the contrast between the two worlds has spiked interest in Bitcoin recently. Um, but, um, you know, if it were sort of non-USD, um, I think you'll see inflation. I think you'll see questions around um, is a gold a good hedge? Is digital gold an even better hedge in that environment? Um, but uh, but in the U.S., the appetite for the U.S. dollar for for now, um, certainly from abroad, is so high um, that uh, we've you know it, it's 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 inflation is always kind of talked about and 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 it is kind of talked about as something that's right around the corner, but data doesn't really show it. Um, uh, but, you know, if this pace of money printing continues for, for any uh, perceived long period of time um, and inflation does kind of creep in, um, I do think that uh, Bitcoin certainly has a uh, has has a, p- a place to play uh, within um, an, a, an overall portfolio. Yen, your thoughts on that? Where does um, where does Bitcoin play in the global currency market? Uh, I mean, it's still just such a small portion of everything. Um, you know, you can certainly make the argument that, all right, well, if, uh, you know, the supply of other currencies is just going to increase uh, dramatically, right, then, you know, sort of by almost in relief, right, be, uh, uh, the price of Bitcoin relative to those has to sort of inc- uh, you know, has to increase. That's like a certainly a valid thesis. Um, I think the maybe... Um, Something to look more into, though, is what are actually the mechanisms for this money getting into the space, right? Who, where are the inflows actually coming from? Is it retail? Is it like new geographies? Are there like new platforms opening up that are giving people access to crypto uh, that didn't, didn't otherwise have it? Um, you know, you can certainly argue. I think uh, I would make the argument that some of the largest, you know, mo- most extreme runups in our space have been when a new platform has opened up that allowed a new, you know, group of folks to get access to crypto. Um, you can certainly look yeah, at that's a good point. That, uh, An important you know, piece to watch. Yeah, I yeah. Kind of opened in late 2013, and then sort of uh, Korea and Japan in in 2017, right? And so, you know, if I think like yeah, and I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I think we've got to move on to the next segment. I want to thank you guys both for coming in. Really appreciate it. Uh, and also note that in the past uh, 15 minutes, while we've been talking, while well, the conversation's been great, Bitcoin's volatility has been kind of disappointing. It's up just <laughs> just a few hundred dollars. Uh, Anyway, thanks a lot, gentlemen. Really appreciate it.